If you would please turn with me to Ruth. Ruth chapter 3. The title for this series simply has been that Ruth is a story of redemption and grace, and it is. Now, one thing that's very important to remember, and particularly I think it's going to be important for you to remember this morning, is that we do see examples of a redeemer. We see examples of the process of redemption, but they are just that. They are examples, they are illustrations, they are types and typologies, but they are not necessarily patterns for what eternal redemption looks like. But there are some indicators, there are some illustrations. I think there are some things that can help illustrate what we experience in our experience with our own Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ. And so I just want to remind you of that because even though we will go through a sense uh, of a pattern of what it looks like in this chapter, to understand that that doesn't necessarily fully or equally equate to redemption's flow as far as spiritually. But again, it illustrates. And I think that's really important for us to understand. Just like a parable, at some point, even when Christ shares a parable, he shares the parable, a temporal example of an eternal truth. Obviously, if you didn't extrapolate that out far enough, it's going to break down. Any example breaks down. Any illustration is going to break down over time. But one of the things that we see here that is so beautiful, as we've already reckoned, is not just the poetry and the poetic language, but I think it's very significant that we understand that there is just such a beauty in there being an actual flesh and blood example in the Old Testament like Ruth, that we trust and believe this is historic. These are actual people, actual lives, okay? Not figurative, if anything, because we understand where this winds up in its genealogy. When Ruth finally marries Boaz and they give birth to Obed, eventually Obed becomes the grandfather of David, who is then in the line of Jesus Christ. If you're going to make it figurative, then you have a very dangerous end game in that regard. And that's not where we go. So we trust that this is something that God has unfolded for us and for our good. Chapter 3, we're going to start with just the first five verses, um, and then we will work our way through the rest of the text. Chapter 3, verse 1, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking, But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. And when he will tell you what, and and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Now we're going to look at this chapter in three segments. The first one here is verses one through five. And we're going to talk about this idea that redemption does have a plan. There is a plan involved. But when I say that, I'm meaning more of the tendency of ourselves to put ourselves in position because we experience a need to have relief or experience a need of rescue or to put it more particularly, we experience a need to be redeemed. We feel stuck, we feel trapped, and we need relief from that. Or we may feel destitute and we need provision. Now, let me say that verses 1 through 5 do not indicate at all that that Naomi is doing something underhanded. She simply is, in a sense, helping Ruth be in a position that should Boaz choose to take up the mantle of being a redeemer, that in that position that she's just simply saying, here is the availability, here is my willingness, here is what we see, and yes, doing whatever they can to make sure he notices them. But it's very important to understand we can make our plans, especially when it comes to redemption. We can make our plans, for instance, you may be here this morning, using church attendance as a plan to find some kind of relief from difficult circumstances you're in. But let me assure you that no matter what circumstance you're in, no matter where you are spiritually, that redemption and even your plan to somehow find it or discover it, you'll find that at the end of your plans, you are still waiting on another. 
Redemption has a plan, but there, it is utterly dependent on another. And that's what we're going to see with Boaz. You can do everything you can, everything you want, but if you don't present it before the right person, and even then, if they don't choose to take notice, if they don't out of their own willingness and desire choose to take up the mantle, it doesn't matter what your plans have been. But I think one of the other things we see as redemption has plans, at least that are driven by humans, again, and I'm not saying that's subversive on Naomi's part, but I think it's important to notice that even though we lay out plans, when we lay out plans, we have a hopeful end in this. But what happens again and again with Naomi and Ruth is that whatever those plans were and whatever the hopeful end was, the provision is actually abundantly more. And this is what I'm saying, that even though this is not an example of, of, or an equal example of this equals this when it comes to spiritual redemption, we do get some clues because do we not realize that as we go along in our pursuit of a spiritual desire to be relieved from the guilt of sin and even perhaps circumstances that we think is, are related to having done sinful things, do we not find out that once we actually have experienced the true biblically revealed person of Jesus Christ, that what he has to offer is abundantly more every time. No matter what our plans are, no matter what our short-sighted sense of relief of guilt is, when he restores, when he redeems, it is abundantly above and beyond all that we could ask or think. So again, it's not equal, but we get cues, right? We get some indicators, we get some illustrations. And I think that makes Ruth so worth it. So let's, I think it's important for us to define what redemption is and what redemption is, at least in the Old Testament. It simply means to avenge, love that, um, to buy back, to reclaim, So again, we put this in the context of when it comes to a kinsman redeemer, sometimes a person would find themselves in a situation they would need to sell themselves into slavery, okay, because maybe in a sense that would have been their version of bankruptcy, and they had no other way of making provision or just sustaining in life. But a kinsman could come along and pay off the person they they sold themselves into, and then they are no longer a slave. There's definitely a financial provisional transaction that goes along. So as you see what she instructs her with, Naomi says, look, basically clean up and anoint yourself. Make yourself smell good. Make yourself bring, you know, some kind of attention that can be drawn. But I do want to be careful to to say this, even though there, there could be, you would have to kind of squint, look off to the side, take your glasses down to actually see some sexual tension going on here. I don't think that's what's going on here. Nonetheless, though, there are some cultural matters going on here that we don't understand and, and frankly, should not ever propagate. Girls, if you find, you know, first of all, don't go to farmersonly.com because that's the only place you're going to find someone with a bunch of grain, a bunch of wheat, and then say, okay, I'm going to go hang out in the field where the bales of hay are because I'm going to do it like Ruth did. That's really not at all. You're going to find yourself um, probably bitten by some snakes, um, probably very disappointed at, at the end game. I promise your parents are going to be disappointed. So don't do that. But there are some cultural things going on here as, as far as there is a humility and a submission and an offering. Now, again, not necessarily, I don't think, sexually, but there is this sense of here I am. But again, remember, they have already met. Now, I know some of you may not have been part of our series so far, and we really don't have time to recap everything. But just as a reminder, as a quick reminder, remember that she has met Boaz before. She met him when she went out into the fields and actually, without even knowing it, ended up sifting gathering in his field. He comes back in from Bethlehem and notices her and asks those who are in charge, basically foremen, and asks them, who is she? And then, oh, well, because he'd already heard the stories of the blessing that she had been to Naomi. And again, Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. So Naomi is a relative to Boaz via marriage. It's not even direct. But he still would stand in line of being this person that could redeem them out of trouble because she's a widow. And so is Ruth. 
They literally have no other means of provision. And yet what a blessing it was that God saw fit to provide a gracious means through what's called the Leverite law, which is family law basically, to make provision for widows, to make provision for those in families who were destitute. But he also made provisions for exiles, for foreigners, for immigrants. And also remember this took time during the time of Judges. The Moabites, who Ruth is a Moabite, were enemies of Israel. (sighs) The redemptive aspects and angles on this are ridiculous and awesome to just watch because we find ourselves there. None of us are born into being pleasing to God. We are born sinners. None of us are born citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are not only strangers, but we are enemies according to scripture to our God. So again, all these beautiful cues that we get and illustrations in Ruth. She gets cleaned up. She makes herself available. The thing is, though, overall, what we're seeing here is that as she's making her plans, they are simply saying, okay, they're taking the steps to say, we do feel trapped. We do have a need. There is a provision potentially. All we can do is go so far to do all we can do. So again, that's the plans. Redemption has a plan, but again, you can only go so far because again, it stops because it depends on another. That picks up in verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor, which by the way, if you remember in Judges, there is a one-sentence judge. I mentioned this before. It's very important to me that you understand, and some of you might remember his name, Shamgar. If I could go back into the 80s and create a Christian metal band, it would be called Shamgar, and our first album would be Threshing Floor. Isn't that awesome? Just reflect on that. For those of you who are 80s kids, just reflect on that for a bit. Okay, I I had to purge that. Here we go. So he went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Now, guys, the threshing floor really is what you might imagine in a large warehouse, but except it was outside. Okay, so it was a large flat area where after they had gathered their grain, what they would do is when they would winnow, what they would do is they would have a huge, basically a pitchfork, but it was was really a much larger, wider instrument. And they would just toss the grain up into the air. And you know what happened? Because of the natural winds that would happen across the plains, the, the chaff that was lighter that would always mess up anything that they would use to actually then pound the grain down into bread or whatever, they would just toss it up and the wind would just carry it away. Just carry away the chaff. So they would do that over and over. And so this was a long, long day. And they would crash. I mean, they would eat, they would drink, and they would crash. And it was public. This is not a private place. Even for someone as well-known and as well-vested and as well-off as a guy like Boaz. Still has his hand in there doing the work. So as this is going on, it says, at midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord. That's not just because she said, you know, this nice poetic language. They had already met. He had already said, in a sense, as a redeemer, he wanted this for them. He wanted them to have covering. He wanted them to have, in a sense, mother hen wings spread over them to be protected and provided and cared for. So as he remembers her and all the kindness that she had extended to Naomi, he says, you have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men whether poor or rich. She has shown that there is great fidelity. And I don't think he means this related to himself. I think he's talking mostly related to Naomi. She is still a young woman. I think we get enough cues from Boaz that she, I'm not going to call her a looker, but she wasn't probably unattractive. And he, she could have gone other places, but she stayed with Naomi. This has impressed Boaz over and over and over again. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. It's another reason why I don't think this is some kind of sexual tension of her just throwing herself on him. She has been seen from the get-go as a person of honor and integrity. Verse 12, and know it is true that I am a redeemer. 
Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Now don't spiritualize it. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Man, I mean, that's, that's an incredibly powerful, beautiful articulation of commitment and covenant. Because as surely as she is a woman of integrity, we see this in Boaz too, because there is an order to things. And that's really the next point is redemption does require a person. And this person has to be able, but they also have to be willing. See, you can make your plans and you can present yourself in the op- in, to have the opportunity of being redeemed, so to speak, or having relief. But all you can do is understand what your need is and say, here is where I see the opportunity for relief. Present yourself there, so to speak. And again, I'm not saying this correlates perfectly spiritually, but I do see it a little bit with people when they go after church attendance and other things. They make their plans because they have a sense and a need for some kind of relief from some kind of guilt or pain or hurt. But it's just a reminder, you can only go so far because you're still at the end of the day waiting on a redeemer to do the actual work. And for those of us who have actually gone through that veil and confessed sin and realized that there is a redeemer and only one, that when we've realized that, we actually understand that, oh, it is so much different and greater and better and eternal than we thought. So often we come to the plans because we want temporal relief. And if Christ in his goodness reveals himself to us, we realize, no, that was just a, that was like an echo of the real calamity going on, which was sin that was going to lead to hell. So in a sense, it becomes good that God puts us in a desperate situation to feel like we have to do something, but it still ends up stopping. And it's a dead stop because it waits on a redeemer. It waits on a person. So this person has to be able by relation. There has to be some kind of relationship. And again, we've said Boaz has a relationship to Naomi, but via marriage because he is related to Elimelech. But there is a relative who is closer to Elimelech than Boaz is. And so Boaz, in his faithfulness and his integrity, says we've got to check him out first to see if he wants to be the redeemer. Now, why this guy is not in the story early on, I I don't really know. I can't really speculate. Okay? All we can do is trust God's providence and how he arranges such things. So, this able, this willing, by relation, it has to, you have to go through the order of it, otherwise it becomes legally not binding. I think it's important then to understand what is a kinsman redeemer. Well, if you go ahead and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 25. We're not going to do a deep, deep study here, but I want you to understand some of the nature of this. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Just going to read a, a few verses. The laws concerning the levirate marriage, okay, again, these relate to what we would call kind of the family laws that God had instituted in caring for the people. In verses 5 through 10, it says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in to her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. See, that is all the wives who've, I'm not even going to speculate what's happened in your marriage that you laugh at. Oh, I've seen that before. So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house and the name of his house shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off (laughs) I know but it's the way it is but here's what I do want you to notice there is clearly an expectation that this would be done but if it was legally 
if it was so legally bonded that they, bound, that they had to do such, the consequence would be much worse than a flip-flop to the face. There is certainly some embarrassment. There is certainly a lack of honor that comes to this, right? But the fact is they have to be able to be the person. So they have to be related. There has to be a connection, a familial connection. But they also have to be willing. Otherwise, at the end of the day, the only satisfaction the destitute woman has is spit, sandal, and go try to find another one to help out. And even then, it was just an offering to come to the elders, which meant that not every time was that necessary or had to happen. For the sake of prudence, a lot of people wouldn't go through the legal system to do anything about it at all. So a kinsman redeemer is someone who is related. They are able to do it because of the relationship, but they also have to be able to do it because they have the means. But then that ends up joining up with the willingness part. Because what do we know about any kind of relationships, whether it's you're preparing to get engaged and be married, or if you are married and you're about to have kids, you you just have this nagging sense of, oh, there's not going to be enough money for anything. But you realize that the willingness and the desire and the passion, all of us get to a place, unless you've just inherited whatever, but all of us get to that place where you go, you know what? We're going to figure this out. It's just time. And the willingness and the passion and the desire, I'm not saying it becomes unreasonable over the ability and the means. But in light of it, you just realize that that needs to win the day. And that's the beauty of kinsman redeemer because that same language is attributed to God with Israel coming out of Exodus. And it's again attributed in Isaiah to the coming Messiah of Jesus. Flip over to Isaiah 50 verse 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 50. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? You hear the question of means? Or have I no power to deliver? question of ability. Behold my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. I know that's not a really uplifting couple of verses, but the fact is, is that even as God we start to hear this language of his association, he says, look, where are the others to lead? Basically, the other kinsman redeemer aren't around to help Israel at this point. Now, again, ultimately, that would never be the case anyway. Just like we would read in Hebrews that, you know, sacrifices of blood, bulls, and goats was never meant to ultimately take away sin. It could only be Christ. It could only be the redeemer. But here he speaks of his ability, but also then he speaks of his willingness. Flip flip over to Isaiah 54, 7 and 8, just a few pages after Isaiah 54, 7 and 8. For a brief moment, I deserted you, but with great compassion, I will gather you. So in Isaiah 50, he's speaking so much of his ability, the power, the relationship that he has over them, and no one else is stepping up, so he can't, but no one can question his ability because, I mean, good grief, he clothes the world in darkness. He's the creator. Ability is not a question. But here we see the desire. Here we see the compassion. Here we see the ultimate motivation, which is love. For a brief moment, I deserted you, but with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Ability and willingness. All right, now go back to Ruth. 
Redemption, it can have a plan because we sense our need of feeling relief, but it will have to give way because redemption requires a person to do the actual work. And the last thing I would mention is that redemption happens in time. And here's what I mean by that. There have to be a particular set of circumstances that occur. Let's look at verses 14 through 18. Ruth chapter 3. So he lay at his feet, she lay at his feet until the morning, but rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the, that the woman came to the threshing floor. I think he's saying this more for her honor, okay, in protection, but also doesn't want to bring any questionable aspects to this because he is about to go to the other relative. So he doesn't want there to be any question on preference in the order of things. I mean, he really is thinking thoroughly about what is honorable, what is filled with integrity, so that there's no question about what the end game really is. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley, which we don't know exactly what six measures is, of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. I love that about the Redeemer and the timeliness of the redemption that's going on. So part of that timeliness of redemption is this, that there are circumstances that have to be in occurrence. There has to be a widow. There has to be loss. There has to be someone who does not have any other provision. That's part of it. They also have to know the law. They have to know what is afforded them according to the law in the midst of their loss. What is the hope that is afforded by God in the structure of family law? Now again, this doesn't necessarily equal that when it comes to spiritually, but I think there is something here that we can take our cues from. We have to understand the loss of what sin has actually done and realize that we don't just happen into sin, but we are bound by it. We are basically born, in a sense, as widows. We are born completely apart from God. We are born from the very first day in need of this Redeemer. We never had it okay. And all we do so often is try to buffer ourselves with circumstances that make life just a little bit easier. But God is good to allow there, just like he said over in Isaiah 54, for a short time, I let there be calamity. But because for the long time, for the eternal, I want to show compassion through my eternal love. In order for you to understand your need and your experience and even the application of redemption, some circumstances have to occur. You've got to sense loss. You've got to understand what does the law say? Well, the law in a sense for us would then say, even as non-Jews, that sin leads to death. For them, they would die if they did not have someone step in and take care of them for food and for clothing and other matters. Even in a land where there is the liberate law that would give them some kind of potential. But if no one steps up, they will wind up as either beggars, prostitutes, or dead. And also, there has to be a kinsman. So loss, you have to know what's afforded you through the law. And there has to be someone. But then it has to be at just the right moment. And that's what we see start to play out at the end of chapter 3, which is where we're going to close out things. But it, it happens at just the right moment. There's an order to things. So we have this pause because she goes back to Naomi and he is so kind to make sure that she doesn't go back empty handed to make sure they continue to have provision. I don't think it's just for show, but he gives her an abundant provision. But her purpose for being there wasn't to ne- necessarily gather more grain. He knows what the purpose was. He is sensing the need and the urgency to do something about this. And Naomi even sees it because he's a man of honor. He's going to seek it out. But in his kindness and his goodness, he says, here, don't go back empty handed to Naomi. You've done so well. Let me help you continue to help her. Luke 24, 21. It's when the disciples 
There's two disciples. We don't know who they are. They're walking along, and it had been right after Christ had been killed, crucified. It is a post, it is a resurrection experience, but they don't know it. They're walking along the road to Emmaus. And as they're walking along, they meet this person who we know to be Christ because of how Luke explicates that. But they don't know it, and they're just going along, and they're in despair. But they say this one phrase that I just want to point out right now. Luke 24, 21 says, But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. What does that show? That shows you that they had sensed a need. They thought that some plans were flowing along to lead to redemption. They knew there was loss. They knew there was something missing. They knew they didn't have a king. We were hoping he would be the one. But it didn't work out like they thought. Because their perspective of redemption was not consistent with what God had in store. We see even some of those echoes all the way back into Ruth. They feel the need for redemption, but they don't know all that God has in store. Do you really think that she's laying there in the straw thinking, oh, straw, that's a manger. Oh, I'm going to be the grandmother of David. I'm going to be in the line of Jesus Christ. No, there is no revelatory moment that says this is really significant, Ruth. She's just simply out of love following along Naomi's instructions and experiencing grace all along every step of the way and just waiting to see what happens next. Galatians 4, 3 through 7. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Enslaved. You're in a position of, you sold yourself into slavery, but this because of sin, because of nature. You needed someone to buy you out of that system. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. So at just the right time, God provides the redeemer that has relationship. Why? Because his line, his line is afforded both on an earthly level, but because it was, I guess what you might call immaculate or the incarnation, that he doesn't then have the sinful seed of the man. But because he is the creator of all, that therefore, those two things make him able from a relational standpoint to be kinsman redeemer for any and all. Why? Because he's the creator of all. But also in time, he is also in the line to be a kinsman redeemer for anybody. Flesh and blood, we needed his humanity and his divinity to be both able and willing to do what he did for us, to redeem us out of enslavement to sin. So that we might receive adoption as sons. Boaz, he's not done this before as far as we know, But Boaz is already leaning into the joy of abundant provision. He's treating, do you remember when he first met Ruth on the first day? What does he do? He invites her into the table. Yes, everyone else is there, but not everyone was treated as equally as Boaz treated others. He often would treat those who worked with him as family. They came to the table, but he went further with her because he said, look, next time you work, you draw water from where the men draw. You eat at their table, at my table, where I would provide, if I did have children, that would be basically my children. There are these cues of adoption going on with Boaz and Ruth. And of course, when we come to Christ, we are adopted as sons. You're not just rescued. You are then invited then to sit at the table and you've got everything. And because you are sons, God has sent, has, spent, has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying. And you know what this is? Abba, Father. And here's how diametrically opposed this is. So that you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
You do know there's a whole lot of places, a whole lot of positions you could hold in between slave and son, right? You could be a worker, just be your job. If you're not a slave, you can change jobs. You could be a foreman. (laughs) No, you've gone from being a slave to a son. And if a son, an heir. When our kinsman redeemer shows up, just as Ruth is going to be experiencing, starting in chapter 4, the abundant provision of the kinsman redeemer of Boaz, it becomes so much more than she possibly could have imagined. It is family. It is eternal. God saw fit to give us this crazy, stupidly beautiful story that is totally in the line of Jesus the Christ. The final and only kinsman redeemer.